We're moving on, and my next guest on stage, I hope she's here, is Bethlehem Desi, who's one of our keynotes this afternoon. Well, come up on stage. I'll introduce you further once you're up here. And applaud. <laughs> Should I? Say? Yeah, okay. sure. And you get to choose. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why, but. Okay. Um, so welcome, Bethlehem. Thank you, you for having me. You and I have been emailing a lot <laughs> around this trip and you yeah. coming here. I'm so glad we could yeah. make it. And as I said, you will be uh, one of the keynotes this afternoon on the main stage. But those of you who are here will get a glimpse of uh, who you are mm -hmm. and, and what the amazing things that you do. Uh, so I, I forgot to mention that Linnea is actually probably um, the youngest, youngest CMO uh, in a leading tech company. Um, I chose not to talk about her age, but mm -hmm. I, with you, I just have to mm -hmm. talk about your age uh, because you're 20 years old yes. and you've already accomplished so much. Um, and I want to talk about city or drive, whatever drives you, because I know just like me and just like Linnea, you, at an early age, you found an interest in technology. You're a self-taught programmer. Yes. Uh, so let's start there with you as well. Like what actually made you as a nine-year-old girl in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. where you are uh, from, uh, discover coding and the love for tech? Yeah. Um First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's such a pleasure. Uh, I mean, I consider Stockholm my second home now because I, I come very often. Uh, so, as she said, uh, my name is Betel Hindasi. I come from Ethiopia, which is uh, a country in the eastern part of uh, Africa. I started coding at a very early age. I was nine years old. Uh, I started coding because I wanted to make money. Basically, um, I, I, want that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make money because I wanted to celebrate my birthday. So my father had a shop which uh, he sold his phone, not his phone, but multiple phones. So people would come and buy those phones. Uh, and I would ask him, give me money so that I can celebrate my birthday to buy cake, uh, you know, new clothes to invite my friends. But then he was busy, so he, he ignored me. And then I figured, OK, what can I do? So I was pitching to people who were coming out of the uh, shop so that I could edit some videos for them and put some music on some of the photos they've taken, install some apps on their phones. So I made about $90 that day. Wow. And I said, OK, $90 is a lot, a lot of money. How can I expand my business? Uh, I've never been outside of the city. I don't know what's happening outside, but I had TV. Right, so we watched a lot of uh, Power Rangers, uh, Hannah Montana, <laughs> and then there is an ad, and then on the ad, the toys they would give you a website, mm -hmm. and then so when I went to the website because I had access to dial-up internet, they would tell you the price of the toy, what features it has, and I figured, okay, in order to promote my business. I need to build a website. So I started researching, and then also people started coming to our shop to see me and then give me books. Uh, so that's how I first started coding. I first started with some visual basics and HTML. Wow, yeah. super, super inspiring. Mm -hmm. And so you're now part of um, a company organization called ICOG, and you were part of founding the part of ICOG that's called Anyone Can Code. Yes. And I read that you started uh, your studies at university, but quit just to be able to p sort of push ACC and to encourage other people and young people to code. Why is that important? Um, because usually most of the efforts that are happening, especially not only in Ethiopia, but on the continent are a lot, there's a lot of focus on uh, bringing a lot of foreign investment, but there's a lack of focus on actually developing the human capital that's available. Yeah. And me having those types of opportunities, I figured I would use the energy I have now to invest in young kids because teaching is also my passion. So I figured I would invest that now and maybe learn later, later but I'm l still learning. And uh, ICOG ACC has now uh, grown globally. We just delivered uh, a training here in Sweden actually last year for 68 kids and we're expanding in other countries on the continent. So uh, I want to put the energy that I have right now in full focus and full mode on what I'm doing. On doing that. Yeah. Yeah, you already mentioned that Stockholm is your second home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're traveling a lot to Amsterdam as well. What's going on there? 
So, uh, you know, basically I, I run the project, but I'm also kind of a PR, I would say, for our company. So besides iCode, anyone can code, we try to build a more sustainable ecosystem. So we teach these kids, right? So what's next? They have gotten the skills, they have no coding now. Then the next step is entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. The next step is either jobs, internship, right? Mm -hmm. So we provide that with our program called Solve It. Mm -hmm. So we partner with uh, different uh, countries and we do knowledge transfer. For example, we partner with the uh, JICA, which is the Japan International Corporation, mm -hmm. in which they bring in uh, Japanese investors, Japanese knowledge to us. So I'm basically going to the Netherlands so that to see, because there's a lot of knowledge in agriculture and Ethiopia's economy is mostly based on agriculture yeah. so uh, I want to see how we can innovate together and see how the knowledge transfer would work. So tell us a little bit about uh, sort of what's, what's happening on the tech scene in East Africa. I just went there uh, to Nairobi for okay. the first time this uh, in December mm -hmm. because I have friends who actually run startups there. Okay. Um, and I'm this close to actually leaving this country, don't tell <laughs> anyone, to move there because okay. it, it's like so bubbly and things are happening in, in ways that I, you know, between the two, of, <laughs> between us, Sweden and, and Europe feels a, a bit tired uh, compared to what's going on there. But what's your sort of image of what's happening? For example, I saw that you're hanging out with Jack Dorsey, for example, <laughs> the founder of Twitter, who decided to spend half a year in East Africa to do research. Yeah, I mean, uh, what I see, the difference between, I would say, Europe, US, or any other country, especially in tech, and East Africa, or Africa as a whole, is innovation is driven by necessity, mm -hmm. right? It's not really cool, it's actually, you need to do it, because people need to uh, have shelter, people need to have water, people need to eat food, so it's driven by necessity, so a lot of people are hungry to do that, and... Uh, nothing is uh, easy. I mean, you could find venture capital firms, for example, here. You could go to these kinds of events. But, for example, when you come to Ethiopia, there's only one venture capital firm. We just started. Uh, so it's basically, it's very hard to find these kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of young people who don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are hungry for it, which makes the scene even more vibrant. Mm -hmm. And uh, governments are a bit of an obstacle, but now they're changing their ways to make sure um, that it's more comfortable for different players to come in. So I would say those kind of elements uh, make the tech seem very vibrant. And of course, there's a lot of consumer base. Uh, when you look at Nigeria, it's 200 million people, yeah. 100 million people in Ethiopia. That's a lot of customers, which is about 70% of the people are young. So it's very, uh, it's growing very fast, but uh, I think in order to scale, in order to grow, there needs to be a lot of knowledge transfer yeah. of people who've done it before. But the solutions and uh, the problems we have identified, we can build it with uh, the human capital we have. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I still sort of hear most people talk about sort of how we can use capital from here and knowledge from here and help out sort of in East Africa. And that's, I pr actually prefer to talk about sort of the perspective of flipping it around because what I see in the type of startups that are driven by necess necessity, as you mentioned, um, you're also doing things like leaping uh, in, in ways that we haven't done here. So you can start from completely different yeah. faces than we did when we started tech companies here. Um, so the West world has so much to learn yeah. from what you're doing in East Africa as well. Have you seen examples like that as well? And, and do you see that people here understand that more? Um, I don't think there's, I don't think there are a lot of success stories that have been showcased. I mean, there's a lot of success stories, but a lot of people don't shine line on it or people don't, care to even look, oh, yeah. right? So uh, what you said was there are different problems that one we see here. For example, if you talk about water, electricity problems, a lot of people might not think the same way as they would in East Africa as they are here. Yeah. So those kind of problems, identifying the problems and finding the solution should be the job of the people who are actually there. Mm -hmm. But also what we need to understand is when you grow a startup, there, you need to evaluate whether you need internal or external knowledge, right? Yep. So you need to identify, for example, scaling. Uh, still, the buying uh, capability of the continent is still growing. It needs a bit more time. So if you sell outside of the continent, there will be a lot of money coming into the continent. So, But understanding what kind of markets are outside would 
need kind of uh, knowledge from uh, outside of the continent too. So identifying where these things fit, I think would be the best way to work together from both from the continent side, but also from uh, knowledge from the outside. Hmm. Yeah. So this is women in tech. Yeah. Um, and the women in tech movement is, is stronger than ever, I would say, luckily. Yeah. Um, wh what is the women in tech movement like in, in East Africa or in Ethiopia, where you're <laughs> mostly based? I mean, um, where to begin, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, even tech in general, I mean, even starting with that. For example, in Ethiopia, the most successful startup is founded by a female, run by a female. It's uh -huh. like an Uber-like application called Ride. Okay. But still, the problem lies within the home, right? Because parents don't think tech is a way forward. So they don't actually encourage their kids, their girls to go into these types of trainings or pursue these types of uh, skills. Mm -hmm. So still, there's a big problem in regards to tech because still, as I said, there's not a lot of like sexist stories or it's not as sexy as it is in the Western world. Uh, so it starts from home, but uh, we're trying hard. We're trying hard to create opportunities for women. We're trying to make sure that we shine a light on these sexist stories so that as strong it is here, we want to make sure that uh, women are empowered and to get into tech. Um, so, I, I mentioned that my plans to move to mm -hmm. East Africa are pretty advanced and okay, I'm actually okay. sort of looking at which country I'm moving <laughs> to. to. I, I saw that Rwanda uh -huh. uh, is actually in the top 10 globally when it yes. comes to diversity and, and sort of they've managed to build a society that's, that's uh, where women are in majority in many yeah. places. Um, is w what, what does it look like in the other sort of uh, neighboring countries? And do you have an idea of, of what they succeeded yeah. in doing? I mean, Rwanda is uh, one of the, I would say, the best examples, yeah. especially when you come into government involvement and government, uh, because the government is really willing to put all things aside so that the youth and also tech and also the country grows as a whole. Not a lot of governments, usually when you come to the continent, it's usually the problem with the government because of corruption and such, but yeah. Rwanda has actually solved that problem to make sure that people thrive in the ecosystem. Uh, I would say Ethiopia is kind of going under the same reforms with the new government, new policies are coming up. I mean, we still have, I mean, I was telling people, uh, we still don't have like credit cards or debit cards that we can use for payment because of the different infrastructure rules and regulations that have been happening. Kenya is a very thriving scene. If you've seen investments that are coming to the continent, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa are among the top ones, especially in tech. So wherever you go in East Africa, Uganda is also uh, one of the most thriving uh, tech scenes. Yeah. But as you know, I'd suggest Ethiopia very much because it's very diverse. It's very, um, you have a lot of things to look into. It's a lot of problems, a lot of hardships, but I think it's, it would be an interesting journey mm. if you want to move. Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, <laughs> I'll definitely consider it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we have two more minutes and I was thinking, um, can, you, can you name your, a couple of sort of favorite startups uh, in your area of the world that you think that the audience should know about and sort of look into and maybe even invest in if they have <laughs> capital to do yeah. so? I mean, I always tell the story of uh, this young man who uh, was part of our Soviet training. So it's in a very remote uh, city in Ethiopia. So what the problem that he saw was when he went to the city and he would ask for milk, right? And then the cafes would say, oh, we don't have milk. But he knows at home there's a lot of milk at his house, his neighbor's house. And then now that he has identified this problem, he didn't know what to do with it. So just with like six weekends of training of design thinking, entrepreneurship, and how to build a kind of a simple wireframing, uh, wireframed app, what he was able to do was he um, collected the data of how many liter of milk was produced in the household he was around. And then he also calculated the shortest distance of to collect this milk. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, six, uh, after I think a year, we went back and we saw he bought his own like bajaj, which is a tuk-tuk. <laughs> yeah. He has a MacBook Pro. And now he's selling milk from his, uh, from his village to the city. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of startups that are 
that people don't know about that are thriving, but they don't have an idea on how to scale. Mm. Because as you said, a lot of resources is outside of the continent. And if people come and see, and if people come and learn about these startups, I think there's a way people can help with and also support. So. Uh, I mean, I'll definitely write about these kind of uh, startups. Uh, that's my plan. What was for the name of year. that one? Uh, I mean, it, he, he doesn't even have okay, a he name. He doesn't even have a name. I love it. <laughs> we call it Uber for Milk okay. for now. For now. But uh, for ex yeah, these yeah. are the kind of skills that we need to teach them the marketing and uh, how to sell their products. Okay. So, yeah. That's great. Uber from Wilkes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Betty, for joining us. Thank and you, looking thank forward you to much. seeing you on the main stage. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.